thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear where you're joining us from. If you want to go ahead and drop your location in the chat, we're interested to hear where you are joining us from this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. Okay, and we're going to give it just another minute or two before we go ahead and get started. And uh, my name is Maddie Watt. I work for The Hive. I lead the people and programs operations. Um, and I will tell you guys about what The Hive Think Tank does for any of you that are new. And for those of you who know my voice well, just hang tight and then uh, we'll introduce Ravi for a moment. And then we will go ahead and jump into this incredible panel. We are so excited for today's event. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of buzz around EDGE. So I'm very excited to be learning a lot today. And I'm sure you guys are too. And we are so honored to have this distinguished panel of the who's who in the industry. So I hope you guys are just as excited as I am. Uh, this session will be recorded and will be sent out to everyone afterwards. So uh, if you have to drop off early or if you have a friend who couldn't make it, go ahead and share the link with them. It'll get emailed to you tomorrow. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy. So Ravi, do you want to pull up that PowerPoint for me? Thanks so much. Oh, okay. I can see people are joining from France, Menlo Park, Vancouver, Monterey, Richmond. We've got some Californians here. All right. All right. Philippe, I didn't realize you were over in France right now. <laughs> yeah, he's the lucky one. Yeah. <laughs> Hanging out in Provence. Eat some cheese and drink some wine for me, please. Uh, okay. I win. <laughs> Great. Okay. And so we're definitely going to see that number climbing now that it's the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Maddie Watt. I work for The Hive. I'm going to go ahead and tell you about what The Hive does and kind of go over today's ground rules. Uh, real quick, I do want to point out that we have an incredible panel of speakers, and you're definitely going to want to ask them questions. To do that, please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, don't ask questions in the chat. Uh, if I see you ask questions in the chat, I'm going to hunt you down and I'm going to make you ask it through the Q&A button. So please just go ahead and use that. That allows you guys to upvote on questions and also keeps it in one nice clean place for our speakers. So appreciate you doing that. Uh, as I mentioned before, the session is being recorded and will be sent out to everyone automatically tomorrow. So without further ado, we're going to jump into what the Hive Think Tank does. All right, so the Hive Think Tank is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders. We are an event and content platform, and we are bringing you events pretty much every week or every other week. Uh, we've been <laughs> virtual for feels like a lifetime now, um, and we're going to keep doing that until it's safe. So uh, thank you guys for joining us, and the best way to stay in the loop on what we're doing is to join our meetup group. I will send the link out to that in the chat. And we're bringing you events and focusing on content that's all about cutting edge technology, you know, AI, obviously, edge, cloud, 5G. And we have, uh, you know, interest areas that we're focusing on, like industrials, health, enterprise. And we do a lot of awesome, cool uh, things that are slightly a little bit off the beaten track as well, things related to sustainability, e commerce, et cetera. So, Definitely join uh, the Hive Think Tank so you can stay up to date on our latest events. And next slide, Ravi. Just a quick thanks to our sponsors. If you want to get involved in the Hive Think Tank, please go ahead and email me. I'll send that in the chat. And we would love for you to join our event that's coming up on February 18th. Next slide, please. And this is going to be about embracing cloud applications in the privacy era. So this is going to be a great event. I will drop the link to that. We just published it. Um, and today, if you are going to be on social media, we would love if you tag us at Hive Data or use the hashtag Hive Data. Without further ado, here is Tim Ravi, the Managing Director of the Hive. Thank, thank you, Maddie. And, and today in the audience, uh, we have a number of good friends and co-investors, including co-investors in Fogon. So thank you all for, for joining. Um, the Hive is a venture studio, so it's a particular kind of venture capital entity that has, in addition to a funding uh, aspect, it's also highly operational. We collaborate with entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs like SAS3 here from Fogon, to help uh, create and, and build companies. The common theme for all our companies is leveraging data and AI 
to drive transformation across a broad set of industries. We see the next uh, 15 years uh, as, as, a, as a period, uh, you know, this first 10 years between 2010 and 2020 was a lot of validation and development of, of uh, AI related technologies. We see the next 10 years, 15 years as delivering outcomes and, and use cases. So you see some of the thematic areas that we are focused on. One that I would like to highlight is this area of ambient intelligence. It's our way of saying edge of fog computing. Um, also in the audience today is a gentleman called Flavio Bonomi, who was uh, very early on at Cisco, who, who was advocating uh, uh, fog computing and, and kind of exposed us to it. Uh, just a brief story on, on, on Fogon. In the early days, we, we spoke to one of the founders of one of the Hadoop companies and said, we'd like to have you join Fogon. And this was kind of edge computing at the time when everyone was drinking the Kool-Aid of cloud, and where the cloud was going to be the solution to all problems known to mankind. And so he asked, hey, are you going to reinvent client server computing next? I said, this is the most asinine <laughs> idea I've ever heard of. So, so if you're going to be a part of the conversation today on Twitter, please use the hashtag HiveData. And with that, I'd like to introduce Philippe Cassie, who today is actually joining us, we learned from France. So yes. uh, take it over, Philippe. Thank you uh, so much, TM and Mati, for uh, inviting me. Uh, really excited about uh, being part of such a distinguished group. Uh, I, I um, you know, giving, giving a little bit of my background, uh, I've been a venture capitalist for about 35 years, uh, doing, uh, being a partner, general partner, managing general partner of, uh, of venture funds. Um, raised about 500 million. Um, the two funds uh, I was managing partner of were top decile fund of the industry, very focused on data. Um, as well, you know, I mean, we met uh, TM, I think we met uh, some, I mean, in the late 1990s, right, where, where we were kind of looking at this, uh, at this space. And I, I mean, I, I would echo what you just said about uh, where we are in the marketplace. I, I think we, it's uh, probably the most exciting time uh, to be either an entrepreneur or an investor uh, moving forward. The, 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 the wave that is coming up is going to be far, far bigger than everything we've seen so far, so fairly excited to, to do this. And uh, to, today we, we are talking about one of the main applications, one of the main technologies that are going to make this, uh, this um, uh, transition a success. Uh, we have um, a group of uh, four uh, industry executives among, among the most powerful ones uh, in the industry. So I'm fairly excited about that. And, and we're going to talk about the application at the edge. Um, and so uh, before doing that, uh, uh, um, Rob, Tiffany, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us, uh, you know, who you are, what you're doing. Absolutely. <clears throat> so Rob, Tiffany, uh, I work for a company called Ericsson. Um, I'm a VP and head of <laughs> IoT strategy there. Uh, Ericsson makes cellular technology that we sell to mobile operators so that you can have your cell phone. Uh, and we're doing that big 5G thing that everybody's geeking out about these days. Um, and being at a mobile operator, a, a company that makes stuff for that, it's made it really confusing for me to figure out what the edge is. Um, on the side, I have a foundation I run called the Moab Foundation, where I've actually created a kind of edge IoT lightweight platform uh, to help tackle the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so it's technology to that I give away to to nonprofits and NGOs to help society. Awesome. Shish, do you want to do the same thing? Sure. Uh, thank you. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Shish, I'm part of the Azure IoT team within Microsoft, and I kind of focus on edge AI. I also, from a retail or from my uh, industry perspective, I actually work with retailers predominantly uh, and really looking at how can we apply IoT technologies and edge to, to retail. I've uh, been in Microsoft for 24 years, uh, really focused in different areas, uh, most recently on IoT and Edge, 
uh, and specifically in the retail space. Excited to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Shish. Uh, Rob, hi, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I'm the uh, CTO for IBM's Edge Computing Business, co-founder in our business. Uh, prior to taking this responsibility, I was the CTO for our, our IBM Watson program and setting the technical strategy for our company's AI uh, business. And uh, actually, that's what got me into focusing on edge computing was the realization that to really fulfill the idea that we can augment human intelligence with AI, you have to have presence, you have to have uh, an understanding of the context in which op uh, humans operate. And that in turn requires latency, it requires bandwidth and, and all the things that we now associate with edge computing. So that's me, that's where my background and uh, looking forward to being on this panel here today. Awesome, thank you, Rob. Sastri? Yeah, absolutely. Hi everyone, good morning, afternoon, evening. So I'm uh, Sastri Mahdi, co-founder and CTO of Foghan, a Hive uh, portfolio company, as Ravi mentioned. Uh, Fargan provides the edge uh, computing platform or edge AI. Hopefully some of these panel questions will help clarify what we're talking about. And also several different uh, real world use cases and exactly how industrial applications in the sector leverage this edge AI. I myself personally have been in the technology industry for 30 plus years. I've been an entrepreneur at heart, you know, been with big companies, small companies, uh, founded a few other companies as well. Certainly looking forward uh, to this panel um, along with my co-panelists. Awesome. Thanks, Astri. So very quickly, um, for people who don't know, we have a, a Q&A button right at, in the middle of the screen on, on the top. Uh, if you need, if you want to ask questions, ask questions whenever you want. Uh, we, we are going to do, um, we, we are going to have two types of questions, right? Either it's a kind of question that clarifies what we're talking about, and I will ask them at that point during the conversation, or it's a, conversa it's a question that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, and I, I'll ask it at the end. So no worry if I don't pick up on your question, it's because it's not part of the flow. So uh, we'll, I'll ask at the end. We'll keep about 10 minutes uh, to uh, answer all the questions that we have, okay? So um, uh, Rob, you know, as you're the CTO for Edge Computing, tell us a little bit, uh, what is Edge? Uh, and enlighten us. I'm going to assume you're referring to me. Um, we've got two Robs yes. on the line here, so we're going to have to be real careful about clarifying who we talk to. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, you know, the, the basic uh, answer is the edge computing is really about moving workloads closer to where data is being generated and where actions are taken. Um, but to kind of give that a little bit more color, we have to start by realizing that most of our enterprise customer businesses um, the business itself is performed in places like on the factory floor and in retail stores and, you know, in distribution centers and warehouses and out on the road, et cetera. That's where the work is really being performed for the most part, you know, putting aside the people who work in offices and things like that, which you could also assume is, is a, uh, a location to do work as well, but that's the bulk of it. It's really out there. And if you think about it, that's where the data is coming from, right? We produce that data either ourselves as users of information systems in the context of the business that we perform or in the environment that we operate in and collecting that data from that environment. And if we are going to take advantage of processing on that data in a timely manner, we need to have things that will allow us to get answers to questions in, with low latency. In many cases, the data that we're producing because the data is itself big by growing rapidly, it's expensive to get all that data shipped back to a cloud and be processed there. So that not only adds to latency, but it also um, increases the cost of transmission. That data oftentimes contains personal, private, and sensitive information that by shipping it around, we're running the risk of exposing it. And of course, you know, many times we need these answers even when the network has failed us or whether where other resources have gotten in the way. And so edge computing is really a way of addressing all those issues. So Rob, do you wanna speak? <clears throat> yes, I'm Rob 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rob 2. <laughs> I wanna echo my ancestor, Rob, and what he said. I think he's right on the money. Um, and so I don't wanna exactly repeat it because I'm, I'm totally aligned with him. I, I'll just kind of give you a narrative of kind of where the light bulb went on for me uh, that kind of leads to what he said actually. Um, 
way back when, I'm going to say maybe 2014-ish, uh, when I was at Microsoft and we were just building and incubating this Azure IoT thing. And, you know, it was a bunch of Lego blocks at the time that we were trying to piece together. And I remember talking to a really giant manufacturer. I won't say who they are. And I was telling him all about our new Azure IoT technology and, uh, and machine learning and uh, streaming analytics. And they were really excited. And they thought, this is just great stuff. This can be awesome. And then they said, so show me the version of this that runs right here on my factory floor. And, and then you start tap dancing, right? Uh, and because we, well, we don't have that. We have the cloud. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and they just kind of explained it. It's like, listen, I have these giant machines that I use to make even bigger machines. And these things spit out terabytes of data per hour. And I am not going to burn through money shipping all this data to a distant cloud to have it munch on it for a while and give me an answer to my question. Um, I need the answers in milliseconds. I need it right here on the factory floor. I need streaming analytics and ML right here, and I need it right now. And I can't. Ex I don't want to spend the extra money for expensive bandwidth. Uh, and also, if you talk to anybody in manufacturing, depending on where you are, you may hear a lot of people still today say things like, the data doesn't leave my factory. Um, I've certainly heard that hundreds of times. And so sometimes it begins and ends right there at the edge. And that was kind of the light bulb for me, uh, that maybe the cloud wasn't the answer to everything, that maybe there was something else. So Sastri, I mean, you, you've, um, you, you're coming from the IoT world as well. I mean, uh, you know, what, what, uh, how do you look at this uh, uh, edge uh, transition? Uh, absolutely, thank you. First of all, I totally agree with both uh, uh, Rob's, Rob High and uh, Rob Tiffany, what uh, they mentioned, the benefits of edge computing, why we need that. And maybe I can add a little bit more color without actually repeating what they've said, is really, even though everybody says edge uh, processing is about processing data, doing analytics and machine learning at the source of the data where it's produced, what was confusing um, these days is, of course, everybody's using the term edge infrastructure, different types of edges, right? What is the network edge versus what is a far edge versus what is the you know, Mac as the multi-access uh, computing edge and things like that. Ultimately, they really, and I feel what we've seen in the industry is two things. One is edge infrastructure, as in hardware platforms, capabilities, sensoring, and being able to connect to the SCADA systems and things like that. That's one. And they also sometimes deal with, you know, software container orchestration, things of that nature, right? Yep. So that's one part. The second part, when we all refer to typically edge computing here, is also processing data that's coming from sensors attached to these machines. And then how do you derive actionable business insights? Because at the end of the day, you have to have provide business value to the customer in order for them to benefit from it. Now, you know, this is where we come in. So in, uh, initially we recognized, we talked to manufacturing oil and gas energy customers. And that's exactly what like Rob Tiffany said, you've got millisecond latency, find out before machines fail, if it's about to fail. If you tell them after the fact, it's not very helpful to them. That, that's yeah. one thing. Now, of course, with, uh, we will touch on, I'm sure touch on it uh, in the subsequent questions about different types and when telcos and 5G comes in a picture, how that changes the picture. But, but that's really what we're talking about. Now, one other comment I, I want to make before I give it back to uh, Philip is that, so what's the challenge? We've had data processing, machine learning is not new, analytics is not new, everything has been there for, for a while. So what's really the challenge? Why is there so much big uh, you know, hassle, you know, big uh, points made about this? Here is the deal. When you walk into a factory floor, when you walk into an oil rig, do you have to make your software, your analysis, machine learning AI, work on their existing systems, constrained compute devices. They don't necessarily have the elastic compute you would typically find in a cloud-like environment. So how do you make that happen? How do you make it work in their existing environment? That's where the challenge lies and that's what uh, we've been addressing and uh, working with um, many customers. Makes sense. Uh, Shish? Uh, I've got to agree with uh, all of the definitions uh, by Rob, Rob and Sastri on, on um, edge computing. Uh, I wanted to add a couple of things that I've observed uh, working with customers and primarily it's around the different types of customers and where the priority of the, you know, the, what edge represents for them. For example, when I work with retail, one of the biggest requirements for retail has been around privacy. Uh, one of the use cases that we've seen from, uh, from a retail perspective has been uh, using cameras in stores for various things. One is on-shelf availability of products. 
the capacity of the store? Is the checkout queue filled up? Is there social distancing? Uh, loss prevention being another one. So there is a lot of cameras. And, in, and one of the big questions uh, retailers have is, is the video leaving the store? Is it going off premises? And, and processing it at the edge to look for anomalies, looking for specific situations is really one of the requirements there. And they don't want to be sending it out, cost being the other element as well. Uh, in manufacturing, the priority kind of flips over to latency being one of the, the big asks where, um, as, as Rob mentioned, in, in manufacturing situations, the, the machines need to be able to make very quick decisions when they detect an anomaly. And a round trip to the cloud is not going to cut it. And that's, again, another aspect. Uh, working with agriculture companies, the, the big ask that I've seen is really around availability because the connectivity is intermittent and they want to have the processing uh, in an offline state as well. And that's, it, it's a different priority. So what I'm kind of seeing, uh, the, the need for edge uh, really depends on all of these different things. It could be the privacy requirements in retail. It could be the latency requirements in manufacturing, the availability requirements in agriculture, uh, as well as you know the bandwidth when you're sending a lot of data for retail bandwidth was a, was a huge one as well, the cost of bandwidth. Philip, if I could, there, there's, yeah, a, no, there's a, a subtlety that, in everything that we just said that I think is important for us to bring out. Mm -hmm. um, remember, the original definition is bringing workloads closer to where the data is being generated and the actions are being taken. But there's varying degrees of that closeness. Edge isn't always purely right there in your hand. Sometimes it's at a large compute facility right there on premise at your factory on the factory floor. Sometimes it's even in the network. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the uh, latency requirements of the workload aren't always absolutely, I've got to have sub millisecond response time. Sometimes 10 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds is enough. And that's even better than I would get if I had the 200, 500 or whatever the milliseconds are getting back up to the cloud and back. So we've got to recognize that this is a variable and that there are different degrees where that closeness to where that work is being performed has applicability given the trade-offs that you're trying to create. Yeah, good, good point, Rob. Go, go ahead, Sastri. Go ahead. And I was just saying a good point in the sense that certainly based on the type of data, based on the type of use case, whether you need a millisecond response or you need a you know a second response, few seconds yeah. response varies, and that really depends on use case. And I'm sure later part of the conversation we'll get into some of the examples. I know in the chat window I saw somebody asking, you know, what are the examples of these use cases that require these millisecond responses? And I think it'd be good to touch on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes uh, makes perfect sense. We'll uh, we'll we'll keep that for uh, for later during the conversation. That's right. Uh, that that's. Uh, I th I think we we've to we've touched on all the all the key uh, drivers for edge right at this point. We're bandwidth, privacy, data residency, cost, low latency, availability. Uh, make make all of that makes perfect sense. Uh, and and so my my uh, my next question my next question is. Uh, uh, you know, wh where do you see the action in, uh, in Edge at this point, right? And especially, uh, did COVID-19 change anything? I mean, do you see more, uh, more um, uh, requests for uh, Edge computing right now? Or do you see, do you see uh, the, the same or less? Uh, who wants to start, Rob? Sure. sure. Rob, one or one, two? <laughs> Rob, two. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Point um, all right. Um, <laughs> I don't know if the edge has changed that much during COVID. Other people may have, you know, when I talk about big changes for COVID, I just, you know, have to applaud the internet for holding together and keeping us all connected. It's held up, cellular networks have held up. It's been remarkable because the whole world's doing kind of what we're doing right now, right? They've been going to school like this. They've been doing their meetings like this. And so that's great. Um, you know, changes in the edge, you know, when I talk about my confusion, because like a lot of folks on here, you know, my first experience with edge stuff was kind of manufacturing. And it was, you know, of course, it's being close to the source of the data. And that started off being that what people call like, they were just calling them gateways, field gateways, and they call them edge gateways. 
Uh, and then there was bigger things like the fog and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's really funny, it cracks me up when people talk about high speed stuff because the reality is your edge gateway is probably talking to a PLC over a serial port connection, which is the epitome of speed, right? Um, but it's close. Um, but, but in the telecom world, in telecommunications where I live at Ericsson, uh, edge was kind of new to those folks. And it kind of started catching on maybe, I'm just gonna say a couple of years ago for them. And they started talking initially something they called mobile edge computing. And then some analysts changed it to multi-channel you know, edge computing, that kind of thing. Um, but the idea was, oh, the edge could be in the network just like Rob 1.0 told you about. And they were thinking about, you know, along with 5G, doesn't necessarily have to be about 5G, but as uh, being able to put compute in different locations in the network, and so right now you're thinking the edge, it's right here on premise or, the, or you're going all the way out to the cloud. And is there some place in between? And it could be on the local network, but from a cellular standpoint, this mobile edge computing thing, you know, if it's in the cellular network, you know, you go from your device, it could, if, it, if it's a cellular IoT device, let's say in point, it goes up to that cell tower that we all know about and goes into a base station. Well, guess what? There is compute power there. And agents, uh, analytics, things that could be pushed down in a container potentially could live, you know, because those are just x86 servers, right? And so you can run compute there. There's also other stages. Uh, you know, it's just like Rob was saying. It's like, what is your tolerance for latency or milliseconds? You know, if I'm right next to it, I'm one millisecond, and then I'm getting onto the cellular network, and maybe I'm five milliseconds and I'm heading down this path, I'm still not on the open internet yet. I'm still inside the cellular network before it goes out into the open internet to reach a cloud. Uh, base station, what a lot of people don't re realize is there's all these hidden data centers, metro data centers in all these cities all over the place that are maintained and run by mobile operators uh, uh, that, they, that they use. It can go into real compute in those data centers and edge compute can happen there. Uh, long again, uh, long before you get out to the open internet and off to a distant cloud, and so, but it makes <clears throat> edge adds complexity that you don't have with the cloud. Um, you get stuff, and it's, it's like like lots of things in life. At least with the cloud, there's this notion of one to many. With the edge, you have to orchestrate a bunch of different edge nodes, maybe thousands of them. Can you imagine, let's say, I'm going to try to lower latency on some kind of analytic whatever. Or I hear a lot of people talking about using edge compute in the cellular network for gaming to reduce yep. ping times, right? But it's not a one to many thing. I'm going to have to deploy nodes and manage those nodes, orchestration of edge nodes across thousands, millions, who knows, of base stations and cell towers to pull this off. And so it, complexity goes way up. I'm having to deploy those things in lots of places, not just one place. And I'm having to push down analytics and update those uh, in lots of places. And so it's not enough to do edge. A lot of play, people have been in the edge business, I'd say over the last several years, and they just build this one thing. And then they think magic happens after that. Orchestration is key uh, to yeah. wrangle all those guys, right? Yeah, it, let's go back to it. So I want to comment on what we've seen as a result of the COVID um, pandemic and the effect that that's having in the edge computing. And at least for us, we've seen two effects. One is, of course, people who have been impacted by workers who can't be in the office or can't be in the factory or in the retail store or, or even clients in the retail stores, for example, you know, there's a, there's a need for people to find a way of getting people back into those environments safely. And so we have seen some focus on things like, you know, how do you maintain worker safety? How do you recognize whether people are wearing their face masks or maintaining their social distancing? And of course we could do this manually, but that gets really expensive after a while to have, you know, a human sitting there, you know, watching everybody else. It's a lot more convenient and certainly more efficient to have say, a video recognition service doing the AI and doing the detection. Of course, again, we have the issue of bandwidth. That's a lot of data to be sending up to the cloud to do the analytic and um, protecting people's personal privacy and, and sensitive information. So for all those reasons, I think edge computing is, is picking up. 
as a means by which that video analytic can be done locally, the video recognition can be performed, detect whether somebody is or isn't wearing their face mask, but throw the video data away so that you remove any, any chance of it being exposed. The other thing though is, is many businesses, especially retail businesses are being forced to accelerate their transformation, their digital transformation journey uh, you know, you can't go into a store these days without them offering you some sort of, you know, buy online and pick up at the store or pick up the curb. You can't go into a restaurant without being exposed to a QR code that you have to use to, to pull up the menu. Those are small examples of the digital transformations that many of these businesses are having to go through. And again, if you want to be able to do that, where you're trying to track your inventory in the store to know what you can bring out to the, to the car or where it is so you can get to it quickly, if you're trying to um, understand and customer experiences or enhance their ability to um, understand and appreciate your product when they can't go in and simply touch it on the shelf. All those are going to require low latency, high bandwidth, um, and the kinds of things that edge computing brings as an advantage. So I think that that transformation to a digital business has suddenly accelerated and that in turn is going to accelerate the demand in edge computing. Yeah, if I can pick up on this, Philip, and my, uh, what we have seen is the impact of COVID is really mixed. Um, I would say. So certain types, of, I'll explain what I mean by that. Certain types of use cases, just like the one that Rob um, uh, I mentioned, right? You know, uh, use cases like, you know, monitoring mass detection or body temperature detection, something that we can do, uh, bring back workers safely into environment, those solutions have flourished. What has happened though, especially because we work with all the Fortune, you know, 100, 500 manufacturing companies, if the workers can't get into a plant, Right, so any optimization, digital transformation you're trying to, you know, leverage there is not going to move very fast. Right, so what we have seen is some types of use cases to begin to get them into the plant have flourished, but some others have slowed down. But what that has done, though, there is a good and bad about this. The, the, obviously, the bad thing is that they have slowed down, especially the manufacturing plants. While use cases like energy management, worker safety have flourished, and the good good thing about this is what we're seeing beginning of this year already. Given the fact that a lot of these manufacturers have already lost production, significant amount of production last year, they are looking even more aggressively, how do we increase their operational efficiency in their manufacturing? They're looking to cut costs. In other words, if there are failures, anomalies, things like that. So the, while the bad news was things have slowed down a little bit, especially for certain types of use cases, they are picking up aggressively now uh, to more than compensate for what they've lost. And, and I, I got to agree with uh, all of the views in there. And, and I've seen, you know, a mix, uh, as, as Satri mentioned as well, where certain use cases have spiked and certain have not. Uh, and many of the ones have to do with safety of employees, safety of customers. So the back to work was one of the scenarios we've seen a lot of traction in. And the other one where I'm focused on is in retail, where I'm seeing a huge number of use cases crop up. So in addition to the safety scenarios, uh, mass detection and social distancing, the other one that stood out for me is micro warehousing, where micro warehousing has been on the roadmap for grocers and retailers on the long term. But COVID has really been the CIO for a lot of the retailers where it's, it's really accelerated that transformation. So many of the stores are now becoming dark stores. They're becoming a combination of uh, of actual stores as well as warehouses. And there is automation going in. There's robotics companies out there that is doing automated pick and pack. And that is driving a lot of the edge scenarios as well. And in addition to that, autonomous delivery, which was on the long-term roadmap for a lot of companies is becoming a reality. There's a lot of pilots out there, uh, both with a combination of uh, drones as well as ground vehicles. And that is again, driving edge as well. So, so we, we are certainly seeing, seeing COVID driving those kind of scenarios. So, I mean, I'm curious, uh, um, you know, compared to 2000, uh, 2008, 2009, or uh, 2000 for uh, the people who were there at that time, um, how, how do you see uh, this one? How do you see COVID-19? Do you see this as worse than anything that you've seen? Or do you see it, do you see it as, uh, you know, more like 2008, 2009? Are you referring to more on how the companies are picking up their production and economy or which, which yeah. aspect are you referring to? Well, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm looking at uh, kind of the impact on the business. Uh, you know, you, you were talking about new use case, you know, you, the, the thing that you were talking about, which were, I thought was really interesting is, 
you know, in, in all those crises, right, you move from uh, expanding uh, mm -hmm. revenue, businesses move from expanding revenue to uh, controlling cost. Right? So it didn't seem like it was very different in a way from what I've seen in the past. So, so I was kind of wondering if you, if you thought it was different or if it was about the same. So if I were to refer to the micro warehousing itself, you know, the, the traction, the, the spike there, uh, I would say it was driven by consumer behavior. So consumer behavior in a, in a grocery, where there was fewer people who wanted to go into stores and the desire for automation just spiked up. And that was what was really driving it. Um, it was, I would say, a combination of, of retailers wanting to impact the bottom line. So in the past, 10 years ago, maybe the only driver was wanting to lower the bottom line, the cost of operation. Now there was a combination of things. There was the desire to, to lower the costs and also the consumer driving it. The consumer saying, I want a, the ability to shop without actually going in. I want some automation in there. And I want now to be able to order online. And that drove a lot of grocers to say, we want to now compete with the online grocers. We want to convert all of our stores into micro warehouses so that we can do instant gratification. We can do the delivery from your nearby grocery store. And that, that, that combination was, what I think, what was very different compared to in the past. Yeah, yeah that the, makes the non, sense. In the non consumer side, right, as I was saying, especially, right? So that, mm -hmm. um, you know, even though there was some slowness, especially people mm -hmm. couldn't get into the plants in the manufacturing world, doing predictive maintenance, you know, anomaly detection, condition monitoring. All of those use cases, especially video, audio, vibration, acoustic-based use cases, mm -hmm. right? What has happened now, though, and again, we've seen this right out, uh, out of the gate this year, is now they are trying to not only improve their bottom line to what they've lost last year, but they're actually trying to increase their top line. So how do you do that? I'll give you a simple example. Improving the bottom line, these companies, the same companies that have slowed down last year have come back and said, look, I need to be able to proactively now optimize detecting failure conditions, either the goods that I'm producing or if my machine is operating, yeah, not operating well, things like that. So we're putting software to detect those failures to proactively derive those insights and tell the operator what they need to do so that there are no defective parts or the machine is not operating well. That, that is helping them on the bottom line. For increasing the top line, what they're saying is, look, I need to reduce my machine downtime. So if the machine is down, obviously you're not producing the parts. If you're not producing the parts, you're not meeting the demand. How do you do that? So what not... Up until last year, they were mostly looking at how do I you know, improve my bottom line. Now that they've gone through the experience of last year, we're looking at, oh, that's not enough. I need to figure out a way, how do I increase my top line and the ways in which I can increase my production. That's where edge computing is actually accelerating this year. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. I, I mean, I like the, uh, you know, when you look at the new use case, right? So uh, safety, definitely linked to COVID, change in customer behavior, right? Is a, and also a uh, also really interesting uh, uh, use case. And when you think about building applications uh, as a startup, right, you need to be focused on the, on the, on the key uh, use case that people are interested in building right now. And yeah, as Sastri is saying, like, there is this kind of tension between uh, now that they've cut, they've cut enough costs, now they need to uh, think about uh, uh, increasing revenue as well. So it, it seems uh, fairly... Uh, the, would, you, would you agree, uh, the, the four of you, would you, would you think it's a good and exciting time for entrepreneurs to be starting businesses? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I his, think... historically, in the worst of times, you get your best startups and your best companies always yeah. emerge from the worst of times. Crisis drives innovation. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's that, right. That invention, that mother, it just, you know, it, it drives you to, it pushes. When you're constrained and stress is put on you, you will come up with things that you wouldn't necessarily come up with when you have, when you're flush with cash and everything's easy, you know? And I think there's a, a convergence of several parallel uh, events that are occurring in our world right now that I think all lead to accelerating some of um, the opportunity to innovate. Um, number one, of course, you know the economic conditions that are that are driven by COVID. But secondly, of course, we've got 5G coming up. As Rob said earlier, 5G um, is interesting for several reasons. One of all, one of which is it does enable some of the use cases that. Um, are surfacing in the edge computing space that 
would be not impossible, but perhaps more difficult to do with other connectivity techniques. I mean, it is expensive to run wires across the factory floor. There are a lot of, you know, other wireless protocols that operate at different frequencies, different bands uh, in the spectrum that have a higher propensity for interfering with, uh, with the equipment on the factory floor that in many cases 5G avoids because of the spectrum that it uses. Um, the other thing though is that, you know, 5G is kind of unlocking a tremendous amount of capital. And that capital is being invested both in the creation of the infrastructure for 5G by the telcos, um, but also by the equipment manufacturers, both the, both the uh, NEPs, you know, Ericsson, is, is, et cetera, but also at the other end of the equipment that will be connected to uh, through 5G networks. And that in turn, you know, ends up infusing a lot of, uh, you know, new interest in startups and other, other venture activities. Um, and then, of course, you know, I think that we've reached a point in time where the industry at large has recognized the limitations of cloud computing and the pendulums beginning to swing back to looking for solutions to the problems we've been talking about. All those things together, though, I think are going to unlock a lot of innovation. And I think that there's a parallel between where we are today in edge computing and where mobile computing was, you know, 12, 13 years ago when smartphones started coming out. And where if you think back then to what we imagined would be the future today, I don't, you know, I think some of us had an intuition that would be a lot of innovation, but none of us sort of recognized the degree to which that innovation took off and went in directions that we couldn't imagine. And I think the same thing is true of edge computing now. 10 years from now, we're not gonna recognize the world um, quite the same way. Right, because we won't be able to anticipate all the innovation that's about to launch. You know, Rob, I thought you were going to do an even bigger pendulum, like talk about mainframes going to compact <laughs> compact computers on everybody's desk, <laughs> running Lotus one two three. Uh, but but we've seen that, we haven't that. we? We have more power on this. Than <laughs> yeah. I do on the Absolutely, we see that pendulum swing over and over from yeah. you know mm -hmm. distributed and back to together and you know um, you know you also brought some great points, Rob, about. Riding a wave. Sometimes it's great to just ride in someone else's wave. And so you're right. There is tons of money being poured into the 5G infrastructure. Whether it's warranted or not, it's happening. And you should ride that wave. It's just business strategy 101. There's another wave to ride. There's industry 4.0 and all these new use cases that manufacturers are wanting to do, like mass customization where they're having to switch to wireless because it's almost like retooling their factory every day or every week. It's going to get so dynamic. And so Ethernet on an assembly line that doesn't change for a year isn't going to cut it. And so you brought up the point about 5G and factories. This whole other thing that people, there's this notion of private 5G uh, where you can have a, instead of using Wi-Fi or Ethernet, you can do private 5G LTE in your factory, in your corporate campus, in your skyscraper, your distribution center, uh, combined with, you know, there's technology where it looks like gear that an IT person can understand. And you put up these little, they look like smoke detectors, kind of where you have Ethernet drops. And it, all of a sudden you have private cellular, you even have your own SIM writer. Yeah. Where you create your own SIMs for all your mm -hmm. IoT and other endpoints, and then the whole thing is encrypted, and no one can get on it. And so, we're seeing a lot of a lot of big uh, manufacturers around the world showing interest. Now, the other part of that equation that's making that take off in the United States, there's something called CBRS. Yeah. Uh, please confuse it with CB radio because you should. Uh, but it, it's. <laughs> But basically, the government is now, instead of just going to the giant mobile operators, they're auctioning off or they're having mechanisms where a, a company can, in a certain amount area, let's say I need a mile radius around this distribution center, I need spectrum, because you can't do, because remember, 5G and LTE, it's all licensed spectrum, it's not like Wi-Fi. And so there's an economical way for a company to get that. And so now they can say, yeah, I want this, I, I, it's affordable and I'm gonna put it in my distribution center and now I'm gonna have 5G and the roaming characteristics, the wireless characteristics, especially around heavy metal objects and things that are messy in a factory works so much better uh, than people have experienced in the past with things like Wi-Fi. Early days there, but I, I certainly something to watch for sure. Yeah, you know, I would, I would say that there's a lot of hype on 5G, although the potential is huge, the adoption is still pretty early. 
you know, especially what we've seen is that some of the bigger industrials manufacturing uh, plants, they already have existing industrial ethernet. And if you have yeah. an existing industrial ethernet, why would you not connect your SCADA systems and process there? For some of the newer ones who are beginning to start their journey on di uh, factory digitization, uh, yeah, they are looking at rather than trying to spend a whole bunch of money and trying to digitize their factories, why don't we install and send this data to, through 5G to like a Mac station, like a cell tower, which has got the same exact gateways running there. Why wouldn't you do that with low latency? That is beginning. There's a huge opportunity for it to expand, but it's too early on the cycle, but the opportunity is huge. Um, Definitely. Yeah, I, I kind of think uh, 5G is one aspect of it. Uh, and from, from the other, I think there's also the um, AI enabled chips or edge AI chips. Uh, the ability to deploy AI models and applications to chips is also driving uh, edge applications. So embedding AI into devices, that is also, I think, another momentum that is huge um, and, and that is going to be driving edge applications forward. Yeah, we're really kind of seeing the anything? emergence of what we can mm -hmm. call the software-defined product, right, which is, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the equipment that we might mm -hmm. not think of as a computer, whether that's mm -hmm. a vehicle or or a camera or a robot or any of the things that we use in the context of the, the yeah. tasks that we perform at work that today are being built with those kinds of chips. Yeah. And, and it's really the software running on that equipment that yeah. unlocks and, and uh, it reveals the functionality and the features of that hardware, that device. Mm -hmm. And it's through software updates that we're able to you know, further extend the value and the functionality of that device. It's in some ways, you know, the the Tesla model for, but now applied to everything else. And, and yeah, I mean, of course it's going to be leveraging, exploiting, not just general purpose CPUs, but also these uh, specialty processors that accelerate inferencing and other you know, machine learning based analytics. Uh, let me uh, uh, quick, quickly com coming back to 5G. Uh, I mean, I think we are dead on, on uh, talking about edge AI, but c coming back to 5G, a question, uh, a follow-up question to Rob is, uh, uh, you know, if you're a startup and, and you're looking at uh, building uh, uh, your, an application around 5G, uh, how, do you, how do you think about it? Do you focus on private 5G first and then you think about building something for public 5G? Or do you think like public 5G is going to be there in the next couple of years and you can still start building something now that is going to have an impact in two years from now? Yeah. Um you know what, the mobile operators thought that they were going to come up with all the killer apps when LTE came out, and they were all wrong. They didn't come up with any of them. It was people in a basement somewhere who came up with something cool. Um, and so, but they always try. They try to have app stores and mobile operators, and they failed at that too. You know, Apple and Android won the day there. And so I would say, Yes, while you should take advantage, and, and you know, 5G is rolling out all over the world today. Uh, most of the, a lot of the operators have it. It may, it's probably not as fast just yet. Uh, you know, if a lot of them are, you know, like T-Mobile in the U.S. is running a lot of it on their lower frequencies. They are, but it's incrementally faster than LTE versus the millimeter wave that doesn't go very far, but it's super fast. You can certainly test out your apps maybe on Ethernet today to pretend it's 5G right there or to, to get that kind of speed and, and latency. Um, but I would say, go for something that's really novel and unique. I, go, after, go after the private stuff, you know, that's, that's a differentiator and that's more business, you know, B2B looking, yep. you know, I would, I, I would absolutely focus on edge, focus on what we've done in the cloud and big IOT with digital twins and things like that, push them down to the edge, take advantage of all these things coming together all at one time, you know, it's always great when you have a nice perfect storm come together. I, I, I would, I think there's going to be a whole lot of startups just around this private 5G plus CBRS thing that just happened out of nowhere. Um, and at the same time, Wi-Fi 6E just got a whole bunch of bandwidth uh, from the government. And so they're going to be a formidable foe as well. So don't count them out either. It's, it's going to be a, a interesting wireless battle royale in the factory. <laughs> <laughs>
the, moving quickly because we only have three more minutes and, and then we'll move to a Q&A. Uh, so talking about edge AI, uh, is there any challenge associated with edge AI at this point? Or do you, do you think that you know the, uh, it's just a matter of uh, uh, the technology being developed and being rolled out? I know, uh, uh, you know Microsoft is, uh, is trying to build this uh, this app, uh, this app store for edge computing. Mm -hmm. uh, do, mm -hmm. you, do you want to talk a, a little bit about it, uh, Shisha? Sure. Uh, so some of the challenges, of course, uh, that we see from an edge perspective is one, monitoring, managing all of the edge. Now you suddenly have, you know, centralized represented an easy way of managing and monitoring and deploying uh, the resources. When you go into edge, you suddenly have thousands of, of applications or devices that you need to manage. So security becomes a big issue and that's, that's an area that we have a focus on. Monitoring and managing all of these edge devices and applications is the other aspect that, that we have the capabilities and, and, and that's a concern for a lot of companies. Um, in, in, in addition to that, uh, also I think the, the the a lot of applications are looking at a combination of, of uh, some of the capabilities being on the edge and some of the in the cloud. So really deploying these microservices based applications where uh, when you have low latency needs, it is closer to the data when you have high latency, it is it is up in the cloud. So really managing that whole combinations is the, the other aspect as well. Sastri, do you, do you agree? Yeah, on... I, 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 yeah, I'd like to chime in. So maybe since mm -hmm. we are running out of time here, just uh, mm -hmm. quickly, right? There's one, t um, mm -hmm. I would like to highlight one technical challenge and one business challenge, right? The yep. technical challenge is always getting access to data. A lot of the times, if you have an existing manufacturing plant, oil rig or, or, or a building mm -hmm. or whatever, how do you get access to their SCADA systems, sensor networks, being able to do mm -hmm. that? That's yep. most has always been the big challenge. Once you have access to data, mm -hmm. Lots of technologies that we built, everyone else has built around right. education. How do you do yeah. optimization of machine learning models? And that, that, that we can do, that's one. From a business standpoint, it's always about alignment. Most of the times we found the hard way in the first few years, right? What happens is somebody in the operator, an engineer on the floor would like to experiment and say like, yeah, bring it in, bring your software, let's check it out what happens. But there may not have been any alignment with the actual business problem that and exactly what is the problem they want to solve is their funding is everybody aligned on all of that. Otherwise, what, ha what happens is just becomes a science experiment. You've proven something, you detected something, now that's the end of it. So because maybe nobody's aligned on what, exactly what was the business problem. So what we're now begin getting good at is when we walk into a customer, first of all, identify, do we have enough connectivity uh, 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 access to data sources? Second, is everybody aligned? The budget owner, the actual operator, and then the and the, and the management is aligned on yeah they want to solve the problem if this is successful this is what's going to get solve the business problem I think that's really important to solve those business and technical challenges there are many but these are I would say yeah that that makes sense Astrid and uh, I mean um, Jason is asking this question right so what what are some uh, interesting edge AI use cases uh, that do not leverage existing vision or NLP stack. Uh, and do they have a chance to scale without the, bene the benefit of standing on the shoulder of Foghorn or Microsoft or Amazon? Yeah, so I can um, touch on, uh, Rob, you want to go first? Uh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Cesar. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to say uh, uh, quickly, lots of use cases, but I'll pick one in manufacturing, one in oil and gas, and maybe one in energy, right? In oil and gas, you know, carbon footprint emissions monitoring, right? Typically when you're doing gas processing, there's always gonna be issues, whether it's um, because of firming issues, excessive pressure in the compressor, whatever the reasons are, what happens is they release the gas through what is called the oil stack. When you release the gas, they burn it. You see all these flares coming out. The World Bank is very closely monitoring using the EPA regulations to say how much carbon um, is being released into the atmosphere. It's business loss plus the penalties. So the use cases that we have done are simply doing based on vision, spectroscopy, and being able to do flow control, identify the composition of those gases, identify the volumetric flow, how much gas is being released, and what was the root cause? Why is it actually being done that? So that's one use case that really scales across many things. Predictive maintenance across CNC machines, pumps, valves, things like that are more a common use case for asset health monitoring in manufacturing world. And then third, in the energy side, 
you know, people are now beginning to say, look, we have utility bills all over the building, whether it's a school environment, whether it's a commercial building, whether it's a hotel, how do I connect to my HVAC system? How do I optimize my HVAC system? How do I, you know, turn them off? How do you use machine learning to identify when do I need to do an optimal pre-start, things of that nature? And it is actually adding significant dollar value to their uh, bottom line. Yeah, let me just add a couple more, one simple one, one a little bit more complicated. Uh, uh, acoustic uh, recognition, uh, acoustic analytics, which, you know, if you think about it intuitively, <laughs> you know, think about all the cases where we as humans are able to recognize when a machine's about to fail by simply listening to it. You know, you can hear those bearings starting to fail. You can hear the, the motor straining and, and that doesn't require a lot of additional embedded sensors to be able to detect. If you just simply have a microphone in the environment, you can point it at something and begin to recognize whether uh, it does need maintenance or whether it's performing at its peak uh, uh, optimal performance, et cetera. The other one that's a little bit more complicated, but I want to kind of bring this up because we talked about at the very beginning of this session about the um, transition towards digital, uh, at one point about digital transformation and the impact that um, we need to have in a world where you're trying to augment human intelligence. In a digital world, you're dealing with you know, humans talking to digital interaction systems, you know, digital machines, you know, web interfaces, et cetera. But, you know, you're not dealing with humans. And, and when a human to human communicates with each other, the way that they understand each other is not just by the words that they use, but really by all of the kind of environmental cues that we take from each other, whether it's our body language, facial recognition, gestures, even having awareness of each other's environment all adds to our ability to understand each other. And when we think about that in the context of human to machine interactions, the question becomes, if you really wanna engage people, how do you recreate that experience? How do you collect up enough knowledge about the context in which people are expressing themselves to be able to understand them in a really first rate way? And that, that's more than just simply NLP, it's more than just simply visual recognition. It is beginning to really assimilate the entire environment uh, in which they're operating. Yep, that, that, makes, uh, that makes sense. Um, uh, other question from Alan Karp, right? The value of data is magnified when it's combined with other data. Um, often that other data is, is, uh, is local, but many times it is distant. Uh, how does L, L, an edge architecture reconcile uh, you know, the, the distance with uh, the local? Yeah, I, I can take a you know, stab at it because we see this all the time. That's actually a great question. We see this all the time. Typically what happens is data processing, it's not enough if you just connect to the live streams of data, whether it's acoustic vibration, video, audio, digital sensors. Always you have to connect to like a specification data from an MES system, maybe sitting in a database somewhere in a cloud or an operation center. The question is how do you fuse those data streams together? We call this sensor fusion. And the way the edge architecture uh, that, that helps do that is effectively you take the data, which is uh, non-dynamic, which is something that's sitting in an external source, like a database, pump that in as like a stream. Everything is like a stream-based uh, you know, processing, uh, just as if it's coming from a sensor. That's how we deal with it. In other words, for the machine learning model or the analytics that's actually running at the edge, it doesn't distinguish between whether the data actually came from a live sensor or whether the data came from a static source from like an MES system or a database. Yeah, and keep in mind that, you know, what we said before, edge computing is not about a fixed point in the distributed computing architecture, but rather different tiers that may exist between the device where you're interacting to the edge servers and clusters to the network edge all the way up to the cloud IT data center. And, it, and you may, in fact, do some of that fusion at different tiers based on the scope of the of the jump of the uh uh, geographic space over which that particular position is able to have uh, visibility. So you may actually do that aggregation at different levels. And, you know, since I don't have my PhD, I'm the Forrest Gump guy in this audience, this group here. Uh, don't be afraid to do simple stuff, low hanging fruit at the edge as well. I know it's important for us to talk about AI, bizarre yeah. things like that, but it's okay to do filtering at the edge still. That's kind of where we started. When we got started with the edge, edge gateways, it was just like, you know, as data points are coming in from a machine. It's like, if this value is equal to the previous value, maybe I want to drop that packet. That's quite all right. Don't feel unintelligent for just doing filtering. Don't feel bad about just doing simple pattern matching 
and threshold stuff like we've done in factories forever. That's valuable too. It's a great way to weed out a whole bunch of stuff before you do the hardcore, you know, machine learning type stuff. Please, I always encourage people when people talk about why hasn't the IoT space really taken off the way we all hoped it would. People are trying to leap across to, to AI and not going after all the low hanging fruit of value that's right in front of our faces. And so I highly recommend do the easy stuff first. Rob, we'll send you a box of chocolates right after this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> exactly. Uh, last question, we, we are hitting, uh, uh, so, so very quick, uh, there was a lot of questions around self-driving cars uh, and uh, asking, uh, asking uh, the, the, one of the inter interesting questions was, uh, um, are there any uh, example of edge computing workload for a self-driving delivery vehicle? And should should this vehicle be able to operate without edge computing this dependency? So that sounds like a question for Shish. <laughs> well, uh, some of the areas that we've been working on for self-driving and we've not done extensive, I'd say, uh, with some of the uh, partners that are building these is around safety. So safety is one of the areas where low latency is extremely important. Uh, in when it detects certain things, what's the response? Uh, and all of that is having a round trip to the cloud or uh, away from where the data is being gathered is not uh, efficient. So uh, from that perspective, that is one of the areas where safety and navigation is being one of those areas for self-driving cars that I've seen out there that the edge kind of plays a big part. Um, and for the most part, uh, once the uh, model is actually deployed to the edge, and in this case, I think, as uh, Rob mentioned, a lot of the intelligence is built into the device itself. So uh, the compute is happening right on the device, and there is seldom any, any out, uh, round trips happening in those cases. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah, look at any modern... A of... Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> up, you know, after you, Rob, after you. Yeah. Yeah, any modern automobile today has easily 50, 70, 100 yeah. CPUs in it. And yeah. what we've, what we've, uh, in all of the, all the conversations we've had with automobile, automobile manufacturers is they're going through some, some stage of re-architecting their vehicles to give them more consolidated generalized compute capabilities within those vehicles. And, you know, that's going to open up a whole bunch of opportunities for us to deploy workloads into those spaces. Yeah, that, that space is certainly exciting. We have done some work with Porsche, for example. They are coming up with, um, they have, an, they have an expanded ECUs in the car. And we actually put our software in the ECUs to identify automated acceleration of the cruise control. We talked about putting um, thermal imaging cameras in the rear view mirrors to, uh, to identify safety issues. So there's lots of use cases we've done, but I think that's the one space, just like 5G we talked about, there is that potentially is huge. It's just the beginning. We're just barely scratching the surface. Thank you so much for uh, you know the, the the speakers i mean i could i could stay like another hour listening to you guys so uh, th thank you so much for all the good content i think you you're providing a lot and uh, tm i'm gonna leave you the, the word at the end thank you thank, thank you philip for moderating this event and just from the volume of questions and many of which we couldn't get to you can just gauge kind of how popular this event was so thank you Rob Tiffany, Rob Hai, Sridhar, uh, Sastri, and of course, Philippe for, for moderating this. Thank you so much, TM, for inviting us. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Very good. Bye.